Okay, we remind everyone that we are recording this event. Please stay on mute. You may type in questions using the chat box and we'll address those during or at the end of the presentation. We may also open the floor at the end so that you can unmute your mic and ask your questions then. And now for our speaker. Dr. Atul Chug is a board certified cardiologist who joined Franciscan Physician Network Indiana Heart Physicians in July 2016. He's the managing partner at IHP and is the clinical hypertension specialist. He is also medical director of cardiovascular research at Franciscan Health. His training includes an internship in internal medicine at the University of Massachusetts and residency at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. He then completed a fellowship in hypertensive disease at the University of Chicago, working with the preeminent scholars in the field. He did his fellowship in cardiovascular disease at the University of Louisville Medical Center, where he was chief fellow, and completed his training at the Johns Hopkins University in advanced cardiac imaging. He has been a national principal investigator in cardiovascular trials funded by the National Institute of Health, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. He has over 100 publications, including manuscripts, abstracts, and book chapters, and his work has been cited over 3,000 times. We're happy to have him here with us. Welcome, Dr. Chu. Thank you, Dawn. I think, you know, as we go down and, and do these talks uh, in multiple forums, um, having this uh, and being uh, doing this in front of our own colleagues at Franciscan is perhaps the most gratifying. So thank you very much uh, for joining me today. Um, again, we went over our speakers bureau. I assure you that we will uh, not have any uh, uh, any conflicts of interest here. Um, I wanted to go over my objectives very briefly, and that is let us just go ahead and, and, and review the guidelines, both in the U.S. and international guidelines at this point, um, to see how they impact uh, prevalence, to understand new methods of detection, and how these are sort of coming to light uh, in uh, the uh, general forum. And next, we will go talk about some novel therapeutics, which really do have the um, the potential of changing uh, the the landscape in terms of our ability to take care of uh, this uh, very highly prevalent condition. Um, as we go through our objectives, I wanted to at least um, highlight what sort of the title of the, of the talk is, and that's to highlight both low and high tech solutions using patient examples um, to really sort of um, make this a little bit more um, clinically relevant for all of you. Um, that to me, I think would be the underlying goal of this entire talk. So let's go into the prevalence of hypertension. As you can see here, the prevalence of hypertension certainly goes up uh, as we age in the U.S. Um, at the uh, in as we are in the 75th uh, or 75 age or above, um, the prevalence of hypertension is about 78 percent. Um, as we look into NHANES data. Um, about 47.3% uh, of the adults in the in the United States are defined as being hypertensive, and um, the uh, MIFTOP modifications plus medications that should be recommended as per the new guidelines uh, would be in that 79% uh, range. In other words, those are the type of those patients. 79% of those patients should either be uh, should be on both uh, lifestyle modification plus medications. Unfortunately, and these data continue to accrue. Our ability to control hypertension um, has been challenging, and there's a multitude of reasons to why that's the case, and I'll go through some of those challenges today and how we can potentially combat them. In addition to the um, those who are uncontrolled, um, uh, the treatment to untreated ratio is about one to one. For those who are uncontrolled, um, about half of those are treated and half of those are untreated. So either they're not treated at all or they're being inadequately treated by the medication regimen they currently have on plane. And the current, uh, and of course, the NHANES data uses 140 over 90 as the cutoff uh, as in terms of control. So this is something that we need to sort of think about as we're looking at prevalence in the United States and what happens as a result of the 2017 guidelines. Now, no new modern day talk, I think, is complete unless we really think about the impact of COVID and what it has done to the realm of cardiovascular disease and our ability to treat it. So here I'm, I wanted to uh, uh, sort of point your attention to what happened to blood pressure control in three major centers, including Columbia University, Oshner down in New Orleans, and Cedar sinai in LA. Um, 
In the pre-pandemic uh, uh, region, what we're seeing is that these um, centers were doing a fairly good job at blood pressure control. And frankly, the blood pressure and the pooled blood pressure of the patient population these centers were treating were actually going down over time. Post-pandemic, as you can see here, those blood pressures rose uh, in the magnitude of about two millimeters of mercury on average. And of course, that also translated, unfortunately, to poor cardiovascular outcomes. And all those data, as I'm sure all of you have seen, um, have been well um, uh, reported, uh, both in the general literature and, of course, in the scientific literature. And one of the, and I think what this trial or this, this sort of observational study highlights is that the lack of health care uh, in times like COVID, and as we go down other um, challenges that we may have in healthcare, uh, will will certainly um, be a challenge for us to uh, control blood pressure as, in terms of a population health strategy, and of course, um, translate to worse outcomes. And this is an important feature that we must all think of as we're part of a large uh, network. Now, uh, a trip down memory lane here, um, I wanted to sort of highlight uh, two things here. Of course, let's look at the first GNC uh, um, meeting that occurred in 1976, which used a, a gut point of 105 on the diastolic side um, as being hypertensive. In other words, if you were, that was sort of the goal uh, that one wanted to achieve. As long as his diastolic pressure was uh, less than 105, we were pretty good in 1976. Now, of course, as more data accrued, we, we understood that that was certainly not intense enough and we needed more um, in order to uh, decrease cardiovascular events. Now, um, one of the things that's also striking about this is as we look at the armamentarium or look at sort of the, um, the, the general uh, of the agents that were being used, um, you'll see these agents are the same agents that we use today. And especially if you look at the 1993, we continue to use calcium channel blockers. We have ACE inhibitors. Of course, now we use a lot of angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers, alpha beta blockers. Um, the, the, the list of agents that we could use or the classes of agents that we could use has not changed dramatically uh, from a few decades ago. And hence, I think that one, one can argue that the treatment of hypertension for quite some time has been a little stagnant. And so I, in this talk, I hope I can impress upon you that there's some interesting studies that are coming out um, and some interesting strategies that will help us with this. Now, going to lifetime risk, the, I think the number that all of us should remember is once a male reaches the age of 55 or a female reaches the age of 65, you have a 90% chance of having hypertension. So huge numbers, extremely prevalent um, in the population. And of course, still the number one modifiable condition to prevent cardiovascular events such as stroke or heart attack. Of course, as we've talked about in the past, um, the uh, relative risk reduction in stroke is higher with the reduction of blood pressure than of myocardial infarction, but heart failure and stroke tend to go hand in hand in terms of uh, very high numbers, uh, very low numbers needed to treat in order for us to prevent those events if we were to adequately treat hypertension. Now we go to the guidelines, and I think at this point we all have this um, uh, sort of to memory, but um, interestingly, uh, the 2017 guidelines really um, took the two, if one recalls the, the ill, you know, the ill-famed uh, JNC-8 guidelines, uh, really did intensify um, what our cut points should be. And as we can see here, normal is still defined as 120 or and a diastolic of less than 80. Elevated is um, up to 129 on the on the systolic side, and again, less than 80 on the diastolic side. Hypertension is defined as anything uh, greater than 130 um, over 80, and, and that would be stage one up to the 139 to 89 range. And then of course, anything greater than 140 or greater than 90 would be stage two. Now this is in pale, this this is in in stark comparison to the GNC eight guidelines, if you recall, which used 140 over 90 for individuals under the age of 60, and relaxed that to 150 over 90 uh, for individuals over the age of 60, which of course was in, influenced by studies that were poorly done, including the HIVET trial. Um, but again, as you can see here, there's been a great deal of intensification of the of of where our cut points are. Now, why why did this happen, and what does this do for prevalence? And why I want to sort of say why this occurred is in one of the studies that were sort of pivotal in our approach to be more um, intense about blood pressure reduction was the SPRINT study. And what the SPRINT study did was it, intensive, it had two arms. 
uh, using uh, about 9,000 patients, uh, but half were uh, were randomized to intensive therapy in which the target blood pressure was less than 120 on the systolic side, and standard therapy in which uh, patients were uh, had a goal of less than 140. Now, what occurred there was not only a, um, the blood pressure reduction, as one can imagine, but we also saw uh, a reduction in cardiovascular events in, the, in those patients. But in 2022, and this is extremely recent, I think this was just uh, published last month, what we also saw was just the opposite. So when this, these patients got out of the trial, and those patients who were on the intensive arm, now we're back to the real life and they were just being observed and they no longer were adhering to this more stringent uh, goal of 120. The difference in CV mor CVD mortality and non-CVD mortality that was discernible during the trial period all went away. In other words, all the, all the salubrious effects that we had from having that intensive arm uh, have greater blood pressure control all went away once we took that off. Now, this 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 the study, um, interestingly, not only tells us what occurs when we're more intense with the blood pressure modification, but it also tells us what happens when we get a little bit more lax. Uh, and that's an interesting, I think, and probably a unique trial in that sense, because we often don't see that follow-up. And the mean follow-up time here was 8.8 .8 years. Now, going back to prevalence, what happens to prevalence when we do this? And as you can see here, prevalence goes from a, a when we adhere to these more stringent guidelines, the prevalence of hypertension certainly goes up. But in addition to that, there's one other point that I want to make, and that is that pharmacologic therapy does not necessarily go up that high. And we'll go over why that is. But as you can see here on the left hand, that if we have hypertension, um, uh, in the arm that has the uh, the the uh, guideline plus uh, the JNC, you're at 31.9%. But if you go ahead and get it more stringent and now look at prevalence based on that 130 over 80 cutoff, you now add prevalence to even a higher degree, and that goes to 45.6. Now, mind you, the concern was when this when we go to these more stringent guidelines, the, then the issue is well, that means we're just going to be handing out antihypertensives like candy. That's not the case as we go into why the, the guidelines were written the way they were. And as you can see here, pharmacologic therapy, a recommendation of pharmacologic therapy for the treatment of hypertension only went up by 1.9% based upon our population data that we have. And that's, uh, and of course, those patients above goal um, that we have by using that cut point obviously went higher. So those patients who were uncontrolled and the number of patients that were uncontrolled uh, went up higher as we dropped those numbers. Now, these are all, these all sort of make intuitive sense to us, but let me go back to this one issue of the pharmacologic therapy and maybe sort of a central theme for the talk tonight. Now, just um, as an aside, um, we in America certainly have our own guidelines, the ESC, which is the uh, second uh, um, sort of um, guideline uh, position that, I, that most of the world follows, um, is not as stringent as we are. Their um, goals for office or clinic blood pressure is 140 over 90, the daytime mean is 135 over 85, and their 24-hour mean is 130 over 80 when we look at the 24-hour blood pressure goals. Other interesting things that we would want to think about is if here uh, in um, uh, in um, in the U.S. guidelines, initial combination therapy uh, for those patients who are greater than 20 over 10 above goal um, uh, is actually only um, uh, th that uh, cutoff is higher. In other words, we. Um, endorse or the or the or the the guidelines endorse the use of single combination pill only um, when or 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 suggest that it should be used when the blood pressure is 20 over 10 above goal, whereas the Europeans sort of go straight to the single pill combination therapy with that cutoff being a little lower. Now, there's many reasons why this will, uh, uh, why this strategy uh, may have some benefit, and that is that the thought process and what we're continuing to see, especially when it comes to drug adherence, is the issue of are we better off getting our patients on more medications or with lower doses so that we're not necessarily getting those dose-related side effects, or are we better off exhausting a single agent before we go to, and, um, and, and pull out the, the, the combination therapy strategy? 
These are things that are still uh, continuing to uh, be um, examined with population studies uh, and a, a few things that we'll, we'll, which I'll allude to uh, later in the talk. Now, going into the treatment, this is perhaps where uh, the greatest sort of change occurred with the, um, with the treatment strategy. While most of us, especially in the cardiology clinic, use 130 over 80 as our cutoff, it's an important distinction that once you're in that 130 to 139 range, or an 80 to 89 range on the diastolic side, we then are asked that we should go ahead and calculate the ASCVD risk score. Now, if the patient has clinical ASCVD, different story. Then, of course, you're going straight to um, uh, uh, blood pressure medications along with non-pharmacologic therapy. On the other hand, if that patient is less than 10% on the risk, we are asked to go to non-pharmacologic therapy. Now, this is a in stark um, difference to some degree to prior um, uh, 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 position papers or guidelines. If you recall in JNC7, we used a much uh, we used a, a lower cutoff point for diabetics and patients with CKD, and we used 130 over 80 in those patients. But here, the utilization of the ASCVD risk score to help us sort of adjudicate um, care in the stage one patients was an interesting um, uh, sort of a, 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 an interesting um, uh, addition. Uh, and of course, um, in some ways, complicated our job um, as clinicians as we're trying to treat hypertension. And once we went ahead and used non-pharmacological therapy in those patients who had ASCVD risk scores less than 10, we were to reassess them in one month. And if the BP medication, if the BP goal was not met, then of course we were to think about um, uh, a, um, a intensification of therapy at that time. Now let's focus a little bit on this because I think this concept tells us a great deal. And there are a few things that I think we as a as a system should probably start thinking about and and maybe a little bit ahead of its you know ahead of uh, its uh, the the general um, uh, curve of how we're treating hypertension, but certainly a little bit I hope for you thought provoking. And that's first is risk stratification uh, based on the, the calcium score and non pharmacologic therapy. So let's go into our uh, a couple of things that I wanted to sort of highlight. We are all using the ASCVD risk score, and a lot of the, the utilization of the ASCVD risk score for for us has been largely for statin therapy. And as you recall, um, where the intensification of or, or the intensity of statin therapy is often adjudicated based upon the ASCVD risk. Uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna, Dr. Kovacic uh, has always done a wonderful job of this, so I'm not going to dwell too much into this right now. But let's go ahead and go straight into our case. Now, here's, a, here's two patients, patient A, who has an ASCVD risk score on the left uh, of, of 9.7, and a blood pressure of 138 over 84. And I'll go ahead and ask you to look at this. And as you can see here, there's the LED, the CERC, and uh, the RCA should be here. Um, but there's really no evidence of coronary calcium. The patient has a calcium score of zero. And here is patient B, who has an ASCVD risk score of 9.7, blood pressure of 138 over 84, but has all sorts of calcium in the calcium in, in, in the coronary bed. Well, the question there is, what do you do? Do you treat do you treat them the same? Do you treat them differently? And there's where we go into the idea that, again, the calcium score not only can help us sort of change our strategies or help reclassify patients when it comes to intensity or initiation of statin therapy, but we can use a, same, a similar thought process when it comes to hypertension. And so let me go ahead and, 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 and uh, show you this study. And this study was done uh, very uh, fairly recently, but published in hypertension uh, that pooled all the data from the MESA study, the, um, the uh, CARD study, and the Jackson Heart study. And what they looked at was looking at what happened to the number needed to treat for hypertension based on whether the patient had a calcium score of zero or whether it was greater than zero. And as you can see here, for those patients who were in stage one, the patients who had a calcium score of zero had a number needed to treat of 160 when it came to blood pressure management. On the other hand, if we were to go ahead and treat this stage one in patients who had calcium scores of greater than zero, that number needed to treat dropped drastically to 36. Now you can imagine 
how important that is and how drastic of a number need to treat that is when it comes to looking at the calcium scores. Um, in stage two, I think the strategy here is, is probably a little less uh, important in the sense that most of us are, 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 are going to treat these patients with uh, with medical management um, once the patient is is been classified as stage two. But I think for the stage ones, uh, this is an important um, an important piece of data that I think is going to help us for the future and perhaps one that we can potentially think of uh, going forward uh, simply because the the risk benefit of this uh, certainly weighs more towards benefit than risk. So key concept here that I'm trying to uh, highlight, and that is that the presence of coronary calcium is a marker of greater risk and may need more aggressive upfront antihypertherapy, antihypertensive therapy in patients with stage one hypertension. So we'll go through this one case, and this one case, the second case now, is going to sort of be the thread for the rest of the talk. This is a 57-year-old female with newer, newly diagnosed hypertension who has an ASCVD risk score of 8.3. She has a BMI of 38, and her husband states she snores. She would like to do anything she can to avoid being on antihypertensive agents. What advice would you give her? And the reason why I think I'm focusing a lot on non-pharmacologic interventions for this talk is because the stage one guidelines were so uh, directed towards this. And frankly, the hope is, especially out uh, in, in, in primary care, the hope is that um, it's it's your team and, and, and it's it's your ability to sort of uh, you be the first point of contact for these patients with stage one hypertension. And so a lot of this uh, will be uh, that the, much of this is coming through your door. And that's the reason why I wanted to make sure that I really highlighted this. So of course, weight loss is important. And in general, one is to expect about a one millimeter mercury decrease for every one kilogram reduction of body weight. Um, the DASH diet has been uh, very important in uh, and has been published uh, uh, on uh, ex uh, extensively for the de decrease in hypertension. It's interesting to see the magnitude, very high magnitude of decrease in, in, in blood pressure in our hypertensive, on average, an 11 point drop in the systolic blood pressure. In the normal tensives, they do drop, but not as much. Um, again, um, salt intake, uh, optimal goal at 1500 milligram per day. There's been some data to suggest that that could be more relaxed, but that's a little bit of a nuance that I'll avoid for tonight. Uh, but quite a few things that can be done here. Um, a dynamic and isometric resistance uh, training all also decrease uh, blood pressure and do it to a similar magnitude. Again, all about on the magnitude of about one agent, if we were to sort of translate it to medications. <clears throat> and perhaps the most uh, sort of ill-defined or probably the most misinterpreted portion of the non-pharmacologic intervention, and that is this issue of alcohol intake. So in the past, people have looked at this and said, well, you know what, then we should probably be telling our patients to drink alcohol. But the answer is that what the guidelines are telling us are not that, the, that to encourage the use of alcohol, but rather to say, if you're drinking more than two drinks as a male or more than one drink daily than a female, to go ahead and cut back down because that's going to decrease the blood pressure. Chronic alcohol use um, is, has a very different effect on the blood pressure than acute use. So long story short, um, to keep the drinks down uh, will also bring the blood pressure down. Now, if you recall in the case, the, the patient did say she, uh, the husband did admit to the fact that she snored and probably uh, was not a good call on his part. But long story short, what we're talking about is that sleep apnea has a uh, a really important cascade uh, of pathophysiology that we probably should understand. And much of this has to do with this the concept of increased sympathetic outflow. And I think as we're going down the pathway of newer therapies, I think this in itself, the increased sympathetic outflow is going to be a key target or a therapeutic target for all the things that we're going to be doing for now. And um, going down the list, not only is that sympathetic outflow increasing vascular stiffness and atherosclerosis, but of course it's causing that endothelial dysfunction, which in turn is also leading um, to greater hypertension. So sort of a um, sort of a catch-22 in that case. Now, uh, does CPAP therapy uh, improve blood pressure? And the answer is probably. And uh, the Hyparco study was. Uh, published in JAMA back in 2013, and there has been follow-up data from that. But interestingly enough, CPAP therapy does decrease 
blood pressure by about five millimeters of mercury, both on the systolic on the systolic side and about four on the diastolic side, uh, but importantly also decreases the nocturnal systolic blood pressure. And of course, we make a big deal out of this, as you all know, is that the normal uh, sort of diurnal or sort of the 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 sleep architecture. Um, brings with it this very important physiologic 10% drop in blood pressure uh, overnight. And if the lack of preservation of this nocturnal dip has been uh, associated with higher risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, et cetera. So long story, I think what, to sum this up, um, the CPAP therapy helps preserve uh, the nocturnal dip and our general uh, sort of sleep homeostasis that has a, a very important correlation with blood pressure control. Now, other non-pharmacologic um, uh, sort of uh, um, therapies, which I think we need to focus on, is uh, and one that was very surprising to us, and again was just published um, uh, last month in the Journal of Applied Physiology, was the use of high resistance, low volume inspiratory muscle strength training. In other words, this is sort of this um, concept that uh, sort of uh, having folks uh, blow against um, resistance uh, would cause a reduction in blood pressure. And what we saw was actually fairly remarkable. And, and again, these are low cost, low risk uh, maneuvers. But what we saw was a very dramatic uh, decrease in the systolic and diastolic blood pressure with just a six uh, uh, a week um, uh, experience with this. And so to sum up, in those patients who had that more higher resistance inspiratory training, uh, dropped their systolic blood pressure by nine um, and their diastolic pressure by four in just six weeks. Now, what's, what we have to know is whether or not this is all a, um, uh, whether this is a uh, durable um, uh, effect, but we'll have to, again, uh, long-term data are going to be very important for this. But I think as clinicians, I think this should give us um, some heart in saying, well, there are things that we could do that just don't, that don't necessarily have to do with what we can get in the pharmacy. Um, there are deep breathing exercises, and this is a little uh, device called the Respirate, which has been available uh, commercially for quite some time, and believe it or not, it's FDA approved. Um, the greater effect variability with slow, deep breathing and how this um, works is sort of uh, have a patient uh, wear a, a little chest um, monitor, and we uh, and with tones that are given through headphones, patients slow their breathing down, akin to what we see with um, uh, sort of exercise and meditation, et cetera. And what we see also is a, a blood pressure reduction, but certainly not as as pronounced as what we saw on the uh, the resistance breathing. Now, again, going back to what we talked about is this sort of um, cascade of how the autonomic system works within the uh, and how it sort of uh, sort of augments blood pressure and and why it's important that this is going to be the central. Um, target and these deep breathing exercises do exactly that. So by by increasing um, the uh, vagal tone that occurs from from these deep breathing exercises, what well, the 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 natural theory of this is that by uh, that by uh, decreasing sympathetic outflow uh, as a result of these exercises is really at the key of of how these things work. Let's go into to, to the case two and um and and see what happens there. Despite the patient's best efforts, her average blood pressure is still 138 over 84 six months later. You try to start her on blood pressure medication, uh, start her on chlorothalidone at 12.5. She states that all her blood pressures have been taken in an office setting and she is sure she has white coat hypertension. She insists on checking her blood pressures in other settings. Well, what do you do? Now, thankfully for us, the guidelines also help us define what the blood pressure should be. And I invite you to look at this 130 over 80 um, mark. Now, the clinic blood pressure, if it is 130 over 80, should correlate with a home blood pressure of 130 over 80. While the daytime blood pressure by an ambulatory blood pressure cuff should be 130 over 80, nighttime ambulatory blood pressure cuff should be, uh, um, should be 110 over 65. And if we were to average out a 24 hour blood pressure monitor um, reading, it should be at 125 over 75. And now this is where um, the R guidelines uh, go with. And if you recall from the uh, European guidelines, these slightly differ from those. Now, 
that gives us at least some targets which we can tell our patients that, look, we want you to be at this case. Now, how do you, um, why is this important and why is it that we should be sort of veering a little bit away from blood pressure and uh, sort of decreasing the importance of what we do in the clinic. And that is, of course, um, we're not going to go over this slide, but you all know the the, the sort of the, the 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 rigor with which one should take a blood pressure in the in the clinic. We all know in, 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 in these times where we're trying to increase our access and trying to increase blood uh, uh, sort of uh, to increase pay, um, uh, throughput of patients, this is not practical. And frankly, almost any one of our patients is probably going to have spurriously higher blood pressures in the clinic. And, and so this idea that we're going to have the most perfect data in the clinic is um, uh, perhaps not correct. And so why should be, and it's okay, fine. So, so the, the argument then comes, well, most of the data out there comes from the clinic. So that's why all these clinical trials are really should be because that's where the the the, the values came from. We should all uh, really stick to the clinic pressures. And that's not true, or at least there's data to suggest that we should be looking at some other measurements. Now, this study by Schwartz done in 2020, I think, was really critical to understand. And what it said was, Look, if we're trying to figure out which patients have left ventricular hypertrophy or have increased left ventricular mass, which blood pressure is going to be most predictive of telling us whether a heart is thicker or not? Is it the office blood pressure? Is it the home blood pressure? Or is it the 24-hour blood pressure? Interestingly enough, the correlation with left ventricular mass was most seen with the home blood pressure which is telling us that this method may actually be um, uh, have some inherent advantages compared to the other methods that we use. So um, in the past, we've been uh, very, uh, in the past, uh, literature has been um, uh, fairly discouraging of this, but I think in today's day, um, the home blood pressure may actually have aspects to it that trumps um, the office blood pressure. And in some ways, these three measurements measure something very different. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that offline. And so the 24-hour blood pressure, then, if, if, if I just told you that, what's the utility of a 24-hour blood pressure? And I think there's two reasons why one should really be thinking about a 24-hour blood pressure. Is number one, to, to sort of identify um, the uh, whether a patient is uh, uh, having a uh, level of control uh, over a 24-hour period. So if there's an opportunity for us to potentially up titrate medications. Number two, to screen for white coat hypertension, which can also be done with the home blood pressure. And the third thing is, is this entity called mast hypertension. And we see this in younger patients who tend to be uh, particularly um, Interestingly, patients who have a, a, a lower socioeconomic status um, in, in, in population studies tend to have higher rates of mass hypertension. And these are the patients who have normal blood pressures when they're in our setting, but higher blood pressures at home. And one should be thinking about mass hypertension in any young patients uh, who are, have normal blood pressures in the clinic, but have evidence of LVH um, uh, secondary to some other study that was done, whether it be an echocardiogram or an EKG that was done for other reasons. Well, this issue of wearables has become a, a very important issue for us in, 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 in modern day clinical medicine. And the question is, um, my watch can tell me whether I have uh, atrial fibrillation or not. Can I have a watch that tells me what my blood pressure is on a in a real time basis? And the answer is not yet, but we're getting there. Uh, currently, Omron does have a wearable watch that's miniaturized, miniaturized the oscillometric method. In other words, it has its own built-in cuff. It goes on the wrist. It takes the blood pressure just like you would with any other blood pressure uh, cuff at the wrist. Um, with the caveat that does not have as the greatest accuracy compared to the arm cuffs or, frankly, some of even the wrist cuffs that are available. If you've seen, and a few of my patients have walked in with these, and if you do an Amazon search, you're going to see a few watches out there, mostly that are going to come in from China, that claim to measure blood pressure um, uh, on a regular basis. Now, what these watches are doing is using optical technology, in other words, using optical impedance to look at the radial artery um, and seeing whether or not um, there is a change in diameter or change in um, uh, or change in uh, size. 
that in itself is it, thus far has not proven at all to be correlative with a blood pressure. Some of these unfortunately require a month of correlation with gut with cuff measurements to correlate with the optical data, but none of these are ready for prime time. Um, the there's uh, what's interesting uh, though is that one thing that they may be able to do after that one month of correlation so whether the the, the blood pressure whatever the blood pressure is at the at the at the cuff uh, is entered in manually to self calibrate the watch after one month of it the one thing that the watch may do that may be effective is sort of tell you when that blood pressure is rising or falling so that may be an opportunity for the patient to say, okay, I think my blood pressure is rising. That may be the opportunity for them to take an arm cuff pressure at that time to see if it correlates. But the technology is still emerging. But it is a matter of time before we'll be able to take a blood pressure uh, uh, in real time uh, and have 24-7 monitoring of it, just as we do our heart rates. For those, um, uh, one of the questions that always comes up with our patients is how, which blood pressure cuff should I get? And I want to get one that doesn't break the bank. I would invite them to go to a site called validatebp.org. Um, what this is, is a list of U.S. Uh, sort of devices that are available in the U.S. Um, that list off, uh, inter uh, that have all sort of have good coil of data and have already been shown that they have good accuracy in blood pressure me measurement. The only caveat, in the, and, and also what's important, is that it also gives us whether or not they have the appropriate cuff sizes. So this may be an important one, particularly for our patients who have either very small arms or large arms. Um, this would be a good site for them if they're trying to look for um, the right cuff size. Let's go back to the case. The patient's average blood pressure continues to be 138 over 84 after one week of home blood pressure monitoring. You again try to start her on the blood pressure medication, chlorothaladone, at 12.5 milligrams daily. She states she will try her best to stay on the medication, but her schedule is erratic, and she is not very sure whether she will be able to take it every day. What is the likelihood of her being adherent, and how do you gauge this? Now, this is going to be perhaps the most central topic because as we started the conversation, we haven't done a great job in, in finding newer agents of, uh, of, uh, for the management of hypertension. But the question is, how, what is the rate of non-adherence? And so here, in a total of 25 studies that use the Mortsky um, adherence um, survey, and we'll go over what, how that looks, only 40 um, non-adherence was about 45.2% of all patients who are on antihypertensives. These data continue in, in 10 studies um, that were then looked at in uncontrolled and controlled patients. And in the control patients, the adherence uh, was about 59.7% um, um, and non-adherence was 80, rather uh, um, non-adherence rather was 59.7% while non-adherence in the uncontrolled was 83.7. So again, huge amount of adherence. And what also studies have shown in epidemiologic uh, observations is that the longer patients are on agents, the more likely they are to drop off of their antihypertensive regimen. Now, how do we do this in the clinic? And one of the things that we are using is the Morsky Medication Adherence Scale, which asks this series of eight questions, which sort of asks whether or not the patients have been forgotten to take their blood pressure, if in the last two weeks, whether there was any, any day where you did not take your high blood pressure medication, and the list goes on here. Um, other methods of looking at adherence will also be looking at rates of refill. Um, and of course, as we have uh, EPIC, we also have some of those metrics built in um, to our <clears throat> um, our patient records, which is uh, helpful. Here, I think, uh, as we're going through uh, factors impacting adherence, there are multiple, and they include sociodemographic um, health care issues. We saw the issue of COVID and what that did to our blood pressure attainment rates at some of the uh, most um, sort of uh, prestigious centers in the country. Um, are th some that are therapy and related, including adverse effects, uh, condition related and patient related and of course cost uh, is always going to be uh, at a, a major um, sort of a, um, a, um, a major factor in whether or not these patients can go through this now, so going back into this sort of and looking at this in its totality as we look at pharmac as we look at pharmacologic therapy some of the lifestyle changes I just talked about 
BP pressure measurements or timely office visits or healthcare usage, the central issue that we are all depending on as clinicians is the adherence of the patient. We are depending on our patient to do what's in their best interest. And I think that just goes, that goes beyond hypertension. It goes beyond everything. That we, it goes into the central topic of what we do every day. We are at the mercy of our patients to, in order for us to improve outcomes for a population. Now, many of us can go into this into a personal level and say, well, you know, the patient, I can only help those who can help themselves, et cetera. And these are important topics. But as we look more into population health, we go outside of the individual. And while we think about what's really best for the collective health of a, of a, of a population, and these are the, this central thought process is what's really going to drive the next stage of how we really treat hypertension. As a sidebar, and I just want to go into this for just a moment, because I think many of you have, may have seen a newer study which looked at uh, the comparison of chlorothalidone and hydrochlorothiazide. Um, why is it that we went ahead and, and looked at chlorothiazide as being so uh, important or why we liked it so much? And that's because it had some natural pharmacologic advantages compared to hydrochlorothiazide. First of all, it's the half-life, right? So as you can see, the half-life and the duration of the drug is anywhere between 48 to 72 hours, as opposed to hydrochlorothiazide, um, which only has um, a half-life of 8 to 15, and the duration is only 16 to 24. Um, the, uh, the medication uh, peaks and has onset around the same time, um, but because of these inherent advantages, we um, there have been several observational studies that initially looked at chlorothalidone versus hydrochlorothiazide for the treatment of blood pressure, and my group in Rush was one of those places that published some of these data. And when we looked at this milligram per milligram, we saw an advantage uh, in blood pressure reduction of chlorothalidone over hydrochlorothiazide. And so the DCP study, which was recently published, um, really um, uh, sort of uh, went against this idea that chlorothalidone has an inherent advantage. Now, mind you, this was a, a very interesting population. Of course, it's a VA population, but 94% of the patients were male. Um, but at the end of five years, there was no difference in the major uh, MACE events um, uh, between the hydrochlorothiazide and the chlorothalidone arm, the only thing that really was the difference is that chlorothalidone caused more hypokalemia than hydrochlorothiazide. And for those of you who write it as often as I do, um, that is something that we see fairly often. But oftentimes we offset that with the uses of um, patient, uh, of agents in the RAS um, blocker category. So I think going back to this. What the DCP study highlights to us is that we're going to be re-examining some of these older uh, tried and true methods of treating hypertension, and that um, with the advent of the of the electronic medical record, um, we may find new interesting data. But again, I wouldn't go ahead and, and throw the chlorothaladone um, uh, radio uh, button off of your EPIC uh, just yet. Uh, this was just one study. Uh, I suspect that there's going to be more studies that will, will help us understand its role in blood pressure management. Let's go back to the case uh, and try to finish up here. <clears throat> the patient states she is, will not take medications, but has heard about a procedure called renal degeneration. Is it effective and am I a candidate? Now, this has been perhaps as we talk about the um, the uh, the development of blood pressure management, uh, perhaps the one technology that has yet to really come to, to realization. But uh, as I show you some of the data, um, you may uh, uh, see that there are some um, interesting um, developments with this. So a few um, methods, this one catheter that we know of is a, is a, is a uh, ultrasound catheter that it's used and has a water-cooled um, ability. So what it does do is you go into the renal artery. What this does is it causes um, uh, the renal artery or the nerves that supply the renal artery to be ablated as a result of uh, ultrasound waves. Because it's water cooled, what it does is it doesn't cause any endothelial damage to the vessel, but simply goes deeper and causes the burn to happen um, uh, on the periphery of this. And with this one catheter, uh, and we'll go more into the detail of what we're trying to achieve with this, but with this one catheter, uh, we saw a decrease of blood pressure of 8.5 um, uh, versus the sham procedure uh, at the end of two months. Now, 
let's go into a little bit more of what we're trying to achieve here. So what we're trying to do when we do renal denervation is go ahead and put a catheter into the renal artery to burn these uh, nerves that are within the renal artery. Now, if you recall, there was a study called Simplicity 3 that first came out, which ended up being negative. And unfortunately, it was because or what we think it was because of the fact that most folks who were burning these things were doing it proximally, where the nerve really doesn't have much juxtaposition against the wall of the artery. And by burning these nerves, the theory is, is that we're decreasing the sympathetic flow because the renal nerves are so heavily sympath sympathetically driven. By burning these sympathetic nerves, we are now decreasing all the upstream events that occur from it, whether it be the, the, the release of renin, whether it be the release of um, norepinephrine and other um, catecholamines that are mediated by the renal nerves. So by burning these, what we are doing is attenuating sympathetic nervous um, uh, activity. Now, mind you, that's exactly what we're doing with all the other non-pharmacologic things we just talked about, right? I mean, this is the central issue here, right? So this is just a way to do it with a catheter. Now, the spiral studies or, or the Medtronic studies uh, have, have probably a little bit more uh, data to them. So if you look here, um, there have been multiple um, patient populations in which this has been studied. Obviously, this is already done in Europe, so we have a lot of real-world data from there. But uh, off med, on med, what we're seeing is fairly nice reductions um, after the uh, procedure in those patients who are off or who are doing this solo without medications. We're seeing a reduction of 9.2 over 5 uh, versus the sham, which was not significant. Um, same with on med. And interestingly enough, and this actually goes for both the, this and the Paradise Catheter with my Recore, is interestingly enough, and this has been a common trend, is we actually see not only durability of the effect, but we're actually seeing some minor amplification of the effect over time. So this is a very exciting development in the treatment of hypertension. And I think that this is going to be, uh, um, in my mind, uh, one of the uh, most important developments of the last few decades in our, um, in our strategies of treating this, uh, this condition. Again, going back into more of the data, we're seeing that office blood pressures here, again, are, are decreasing over time uh, from, from, the, the, uh, from the six months to three year range, but also ambulatory blood pressure um, um, uh, values are also dropping from six months to three year range. So this again is telling us that we are um, doing a fairly effective job uh, with this um, strategy. What it, the strategy is also telling us is that the mean number of medications that a patient was being, that was a resistant hypertension, a tensive was being, uh, was used is also decreasing with time. So again, um, these are all positive um, signals. And of course, the next question is, is it safe, right? Are, is taking a, uh, by the way, the, the just, to, just to highlight this, the Medtronic catheter um, uh, uses uh, radiofrequency uh, as opposed to the uh, to the uh, ultrasound that's used uh, from the uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from the from Paradise catheter. Now, is it safe? And the answer is yes. Um, as you can see here, uh, only one uh, of all the safety events in the in in the spiral on med study, uh, we saw only one um, say safety end uh, an endpoint event. Um, there was one hospitalization for, for uh, emergency crisis, and of course, new stroke was one here, um, but really very low numbers considered the, the size of this study. The limitations are thus point is like anything else that's new. We don't have outcome data. Is this like clonidine? Is the decrease in the blood pressure due to the renal denervation be, um, uh, going to be inert in terms of um, events, or is it going to really translate to something in terms of reduction in blood pressure, in reduction of events? Interesting enough, we also think that the, the technology may be helpful in other conditions, simply because so many of the things in cardiovascular diseases are mediated by the, by the sympathetic nervous system. Things like atrial fibrillation, heart failure, these are all um, uh, largely un, uh, unexplored. Now, we at Franciscan anticipate this. Uh, it's uh, been me and, and Dr. Sunil Advani, who's been 
uh, critical in, in our ability to really push for this, um, uh, that we should have uh, this uh, here at Franciscan by the summer if it gets FDA approval, as we've been working very hard to make sure that we are um, first at bat for the technology and it will be ready to use. So in summary, um, the AHA ACC guidelines have ruined, have lowered the at gold thresholds, um, uh, increasing prevalence of hypertension in the U.S. The guidelines have focused on both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic methods of both blood pressure lowering. And today, I tried our, uh, to to sort of um, give you a combination of low and high um, uh, and high tech um, as strategies for this. And of course, new methods of blood pressure lowering um, uh, are really welcome as uh, additions to armamentarium have been largely unchanged for a long time. And with that, I, I want to thank all of you uh, for spending some time with me uh, this evening talking about hypertension and would welcome any questions, comments, etc. Uh, but again, thank you very much. Anyone who has a question, feel free to speak or put a message in the chat. Here's one question, Dr. Chubb. Did I hear, understand you say that all patients, including those 60 years of age and older, should aim for a blood pressure lower than 130 over 80? Correct. Yep. Yep. That's what the guidelines state. And that's, um, and in fact, what the SPRINT study showed uh, interestingly, was that we always felt that that there was always a uh, a higher amount of frailty when it came to older patients, and so there was a thought process that don't be so aggressive with these patients. Don't 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 drop them down too low because they're going to have more more events if if or they're going to fall. They're going to have uh, it's going to have too many adverse events. And what the studies have shown thus far is just the opposite. Is that that by lowering their blood pressure lower to that goal, lower than that goal, then um, um, what happens is we go down lower to that goal is that we actually improve cognitive function. So there's a bit, a lot of interesting um, sidebars on this in terms of the effects that it has and, and, and frankly has been uh, kind of eye-opening to us. Atul, this is Joe LaRosa with the ACO. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to, again, congratulate you on a great presentation tonight. It was well prepared. You're a gifted speaker, a gifted teacher. We're blessed to have you and a part of our medical staff. And I thought this conference was just, this this hour was, was excellent. So thank you for putting it together for all of us. You did a great job. Thanks a lot, Dr. Rose. I guess uh, with that, do you want to go jam after this, I guess, is the question. <laughs> yeah, we do need a jam. <laughs> So there's uh, another question. I saw this. Did, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. You know, what suggestions do you have for your patients to prevent burnout with regard to blood pressure monitoring once a day, once a week, and um, and, and addressing adher adherence issues? So, I think this is a, a again adherence of all in, in everything is so critical. And and the issue of blood pressure management is that I m most of the time what I'm what, what I'm saying to patients is the following that we are going to be working very in close to each other for a short period of time in order to get you at goal. And once we get you at goal, we can really relax some of the ways in which we do it. So the thought and the, the normal line that I have for my patients, you're not at goal with your blood pressure. For the first month, you and I are going to be best friends. In the next three months, you and I are going to be, um, uh, we're going to sort of see each other at the mall and say hi. After that, after your goal, you're going to be that Facebook friend that just goes ahead and tells and wishes me happy birthday every year. And what I'm saying is, I think to set up the expectation of the patient that you're going to go ahead and do everything you can and make it a little bit more intense for the short term, only to make sure that for the long term, this becomes more relaxed. And so for the early period stages, especially for patients who are at goal, I'm asking my patients to take blood pressures twice a day, twice every time for a week both in the first half hour upon waking up and in the last half hour before sleeping. You know, why, why is it so important for them for that first half hour? The first half hour upon waking up, after the patient has voided and gone to the restroom, what we're trying to do there, we're doing that because we want to make sure that, that, that those pressures are going to be the highest during that time because of the catecholamine surge uh, related to wakefulness. 
as you've seen with epidemiologic studies and observational studies, is that the the rates of heart attack and stroke are the highest in that in that in that that first hour upon waking up. So long story short, what we're trying to do is 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 sort of be a little bit um, to set up those expectations, understand that you're going to be intense early on, and then you're going to uh, down try treat that. Now, in terms of addressing adherence is issues with medications, a lot of that has to do with sort of daily routine and really taking on side effects with uh, head on. I think what's really frustrating for patients to hear is if a patient feels that a side effect is due to a medication. And the clinician says, no, that's in your head. That's not even in the in, in the package uh, insert as a side effect. So you're just crazy. And you're not telling your patients you're crazy. I understand. We're, we're Franciscan, right? We're, we're, we're compassionate. We, we get that. But we're, we're, that's the message that the patient is getting when we say that. Oftentimes, you have to go through the process and say, OK, fine. Let's stop that medication. Let's see if you feel any better. Did you feel any better? Half the time, the patient's going to say, no, I found nothing better. Then, of course, that you're you're sort of helping that patient along. This is a marathon, not a race. But I think listening to patients and 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 giving them uh, the ability to, to to voice their concerns and to really go through this methodology with, with some methodology would be helpful. I hope I've answered your question, Dr. Rao. So, Dr. Chug, how, how does a provider know when it's time to refer a hypertensive patient to a specialist? Right. So, so a great question. So, in general, what what guidelines state is if a patient is a as a resistant hypertensive who's on three or more agents, hopefully that includes a thiazide like diuretic who's not at goal. That may be the time to go ahead and 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 get that patient to a um, to a hypertension specialist, especially if they have some aid, uh, some uh, evidence of of um, end organ damage. If, on the other hand, the refractory hypertensions, which is five agents or more that includes a thiazide like diuretic and, and, and spironolactone, that should be an automatic, I think, go to a hypertensive specialist for further evaluation and treatment. Are there any more questions? From the group, we have a couple more minutes. Atul, uh, Atul this is Sandeep Kukreja. Hi, Sandeep. Can hey, uh, uh, great presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank you once again for enlightening us all on this topic. Um, quick question: So, in terms of non-pharmacological methods, um, and specifically alluding to exercise. Do you do you specifically prescribe? I mean, is there any data to suggest that you need certain amount of exercise a day to optimize blood pressure control? And is there like a dose dependent uh, drop in blood pressure with the amount and type of exercise you do? Yes, there is. And I'll go back to the slide so I can actually go ahead and, and the guidelines are very specific about that. So let me go ahead and, and get to that um, in just a moment here. But um, there's differences between the dynamic um, exercise and non-dynamic exercise. And um, here, the um, for aerobic activity, it's sort of 90 to 150 minutes per week with a heart rate reserve uh, of between 65 and 75. Dynamic uh, would be, uh, again, the resistance training would be uh, fairly prescribed as well. And again, these data are coming from exercise physiology studies um, and have been extrapolated uh, again with, with some variation. Now, is there a dose dependence? And the answer is yes. But interestingly enough, once you get to a certain threshold, you actually plateau. There's only so much you can get to on this. So this sort of is these the numbers that have been stated by the guidelines here are somewhat sort of the, the best case, sort of not so much best case scenario, but really after more than this isn't going to get you a whole lot more. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess to some extent, like everything we do, um, individuals probably have their own threshold. And if I were to use the term dose of exercise that is optimal for them. Um, right. And I imagine uh, that's to sort of each individual to to figure out and try to try to follow. Right. And, and I mean, going to that point, 
these strategies of physical activity may not be feasible for certain candidates, right? So this may not be the best right, non-pharmacological right. intervention you can use for a patient. So the point is, I think, just like anything else, just like we have uh, what our therapeutic sort of strategies are for anything that we do in medicine, right? We think about how to attack a problem in, by, in a multifaceted fashion. So if we used four or five different non-pharmacological interventions, on top of that, we used a medication, we could get to where we need to go. Um, and and get patients to go. It just matters. What what matters is what is the most the likelihood of adherence. And in the current era, I must admit to you, Sandeep, my biggest concern at this point, and where my my concern goes as a, as a population, is that the rates of adherence are so low, uh, for multiple right. reasons. Um, that uh, we do need um, uh, sort of a multi pronged approach to this um, overall. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Atul. Great talk. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for this presentation, and thank you everyone for being on the line to learn from Dr. Chug. I will post the evaluation link in the chat so you can uh, get the CME if you're interested in that. Um, thank you so much, and uh, this concludes our program. Thank you, everyone.